The White Bear Lake Lake the White Bear Lake Area League of Women Voters welcomes you to this virtual forum for candidates in the November election for House Districts 36A and B. This forum is being broadcast live and recorded by Nine North and will be available on the White Bear Lake Area YouTube channel. My name is Liz Nordling and I will be moderating this forum tonight. I do not live in District 36. As a trusted volunteer organization, the League of Women Voters does not support or oppose political parties or candidates. We sponsor forums like this to provide voters an opportunity to hear candidates' views about issues of interest in the upcoming election. Tonight we will be exploring candidates' answers to topics related to education, budget and finance, public safety, health care, elections, climate and equity providing an opportunity for them to respond to questions submitted to the League of Women Voters by members of the public. We have received dozens of questions from the public, many more than we could possibly ask, but we tried to cover all of the issues that were mentioned. The order for speaking tonight will begin in alphabetical order by race and will be rotated randomly thereafter. Candidates' remarks are being timed to assure equality of time. The candidates participating in tonight's forum are in House District 36A, Elliot Engen and Susie Strom. In House District 36B, Brian Curran and Heidi Gunderson. We're going to go right to questions and the, question, the first question goes to you, Elliot, and it is on education. What should the legislature's role, if any, be in determining school curriculum and what is taught in classrooms throughout the state? Yeah, well, when it comes to education as a whole, we want to make sure that we're equipping our students with the knowledge that they need to succeed. And it should really be our first and primary goal to equip them with reading and math literacy that they need. And right now, we actually have the largest achievement gap in the nation as a state. We need to make sure that we, we buckle down on education this upcoming legislative, uh, legislative biennium and actually start to give schools the resources that, that they need to teach most of all that reading and math that we're talking about. So that's, that would be my first uh, priority. And um, when, when it comes to our state passing down curriculum, I think that that needs to be something that localities actually consider, and there should be local control in that curriculum. Thank you. The question now goes to Susie Strom. Thank you. Well, every child, no matter what they look like, or their zip code deserves to have a world-class education. And the government um, should provide resources to, to public schools so they can continue to serve um, all students in the community. Um, learning loss is definitely something that we need to address, especially after coming out of a global pandemic. So we need to um, address that comprehensively, and we need to make more investments in um, mental health services and support staff. Thank you. The question now goes to Brian Curran. Sure. Um, so I believe that the legislative role um, or the legislation does play a critical role in education. And we need to make sure that we're ensuring teachers are equipped with all the resources that they need in the classroom, uh, not just to meet a specific group of students, but to make sure that they're meeting the needs of uh, the, the very unique needs of all different students in the classroom. Um, I also need, think we need to make sure that mental health supports are provided in our schools. Uh, as candidate Strom mentioned, um, we know that students are falling behind and um, they have learning loss from the pandemic. So we need to make sure we're providing additional resources in schools to accommodate for the losses that we've seen over the last couple of years. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. Yes, as, as the other candidates have said, there's been a lot of learning loss. I had three kids in uh, public school during the pandemic, and first of all, the teachers did a fantastic job um, learning on the fly. There wasn't a playbook, so I, I say kudos to the teachers for their flexibility. But we've seen the effects of the pandemic um, on their learning loss, and I think that as a le in the legislature, we need to make sure that we're adequately funding the needs of the teachers and the students, special education, literacy programs, and of course, safety. Those would be my priorities. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? We'll move on to, oh, yes, Elliot. Yeah, I would say that the one thing that we're noticing when it comes to the mental health crisis that our students are facing, we've seen over a 50% increase in mental health struggles amongst our most vulnerable, uh, which is youth in classrooms. So if we really want to address that, we had to have looked at that 
prior. I mean, we had uh, two and a half years of shutdowns in schools, and that's something that I think is really going to be hurting us for the now and uh, into the future if we don't address it. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll move on to the next question. It goes to Brian Curran first. If elected, what will you do to ensure that funding of our public schools adequately keeps up with inflation and growth? Sure. Um, if I'm if I am elected, um, I want to make sure that we are addressing uh, the fact that we've been trying to increase education funding for years and years. When I talk to constituents, I hear often that we have education bills. Uh, on the table all the time. We just keep spending money, but the fact remains that we've been asking for money. Uh, we're coming from behind. Uh, these bills have not been getting passed year after year after year. And we had uh, an amazing opportunity last session uh, that unfortunately Republicans walked away from, uh, where we could have really um, shored up in some of those areas that we were just talking about in the previous question. Thank you. The question now goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, so when it comes to the funding of public education, we want to make sure that it's staying with the students and the teachers in the classrooms and not bureaucrats in boardrooms. Um, I was actually knocking uh, doors in Lionel Lakes and ran into a teacher who shared with me that they were given a new curriculum standard uh, mid-pandemic. And nothing could be uh, more uh, hard to navigate than being handed that while you're also trying to learn uh, virtual, virtual school. So if we want to... Uh, adequately fund public education, it's going to make sure that those dollars are actually staying where they need to go rather than just being eaten up by bureaucratic entities. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Sure. I would agree with uh, what candidate Engen said. Um, we need to make sure that the dollars are staying where they're supposed to be. And we know that our schools have a lot of needs, whether it's capital or improvements or whether it's operating budgets. And I think that parents are really looking for some transparency in how those dollars are spent. When we look at things like referendums, you know, in White Bear Lake, we have the largest one in state history. And there's been a little bit of pushback on that. So I think at the legislature, we just need to make sure that those dollars are accounted for and being spent wisely and meeting the needs in the schools. Thank you. Question now goes to Susie Strom. Yes, we need to make sure that the index is keeping up with inflation. We need to make sure that we are supporting our schools, especially um, as we address um, the needs coming out of the global pandemic. And we need to make sure that uh, special, uh, special education uh, cross subsidies are addressed as well. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Then we'll move on to the next question. It goes to Heidi Gunderson first. What strategies would you recommend the state adopt to reduce the academic gap? Again, I think we need to listen to what our educators are saying, and I think literacy is so very important. And with new mandates of curriculum coming down, um, you know, we're, we're learning that teachers are struggling with some of those things. And with the kids and the learning loss coming out of the pandemic, we need to get back to basics and make sure that we're meeting those kids where they are. So I think that those standards are really important moving forward. Thank you. The question now goes to Susie Strom. Yes, so literacy is important, but it is not the only thing we need to, um, we have seen that there, there are other issues as well. Um, it's about um, addressing anxiety and mental health issues for the students so that they, um, they have the tools they need to, um, to learn and, and thrive and, um, and so we should support a comprehensive, um, um, concert, comprehensive support. Thank you. The question you. now goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, well, I think academic standards definitely are something that we should be prioritizing in our schools. Um, it, it comes down to this, folks. We have a 56% reading proficiency amongst our students. We have a 48% math proficiency. I believe those are the numbers. And if that's the case, then that needs to be our first and primary uh, focus. We need to make sure that these, these students are coming out of the, our public education system ready to tackle the world. And if that's not what we're doing, then uh, that's not necessarily the primary goal of, of our public education system. So it needs to start with making sure that our students are equipped. Thank you. The question now goes to Brian Gurn. Sure. Um, so, of course, we have a large uh, academic gap that we need to make sure that we're doing a lot to work on. But it goes a whole lot further than just teaching reading and math in the, in the classroom. Uh, it goes a whole lot further than just literacy itself. 
Um, we need to recognize the effect that uh, mental health issues have in education, uh, the effect that the pandemic has had on education and the changing needs of all of our students. And that also means we need to look at how students learn and making sure we have the best environment possible for students to learn in. And that means that we need to fully fund things like special education to make sure that uh, those, those students are getting all the resources that they need to succeed. And we also need to make sure that we're incorporating social emotional learning in the classroom, something that teachers um, really have been asking for more of so that students can learn how to connect the information they're learning in the classroom to the real world. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? I do, I, I have one. Right now we have a lower academic standard in our proficiencies than Mississippi. And that's not um, something that I think Minnesotans should be proud of. Uh, our funding uh, is drastically over the state of Mississippi, yet for some reason we continue to lag behind. I think if we want to have a great place where families can confidently say that they are preparing their students, their children for their future, uh, then we need to up our standards. Thank you. Anyone else? We're going to move on to the next question and a new topic. We're going to talk about budget and finance. And the question goes first to Susie Strom. The 2022 legislative session ended with no action on the remaining $7.2 billion state surplus. What do you believe the state should do with that surplus? So uh, with the um, budget agreement, there was an agreement that was negotiated in good faith. And I think there were many things that would have helped Minnesotans, especially in a time of need. Um, and I, I would advocate for things like um, ending Social Security that were included. I would advocate for um, things like child uh, care credits. And um, we should put it into things that will help Minnesotans. We should have a rainy day fund. And um, those are the things that would be, would help our state. Thank you. Thank you. Question now goes to Brianne Kern. Sure. Um, so there was a whole lot of work that we could have done with the surplus that was left on the table. Um, the fact remains that, again, Republicans walked away and we weren't able to uh, come up with something that met common ground for Minnesotans. Uh, it's a disappointment. Um, there were a lot of great plans that would have benefited Minnesotans. Um, like candidate Strom mentioned, uh, cutting taxes on Social Security. Everybody cares about that right now, and that would have passed alone, um, I'm sure, with full bipartisan support. Um, and those are the kind of things that were being worked on, as she said again, in good faith, um, that at the end of the day didn't happen for folks. Um, we also had an opportunity to try to uh, you know, shore up on the education gaps that we were just talking about with some of that funding as well. Um, so we had a lot of opportunity. There were a lot of plans. Uh, we were all set to go. And um, at the end of the day, um, folks walked away from it. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. Yes, I think the, the surplus is historic and growing, and we continue to collect more tax revenue than we are forecasting. The problem is that we are overtaxing Minnesotans. I think with a surplus like this and inflation where it's at, we can make meaningful tax cuts for all Minnesotans, um, especially the tax on Social Security to eliminate that from seniors. I think we're one of only 12 states that, that taxes Social Security, so that seems like something everyone can agree on. Hopefully there can be some compromise in the with the upcoming legislature to actually get some of these common sense things done, but meaningful tax cuts for all Minnesotans to put money back in their pockets so they can deal with these difficult economic times. Thank you. The question now goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, well, I'll say first and foremost, there was a deal that was agreed on and uh, Walls had put some contingencies on that that, um, that weren't met. And so therefore, everybody walked away. This wasn't a Republican only walking away from doing their job. Uh, that's where I would start. But second, we do need long-term immediate tax cuts for Minnesota families and for Main Street business. Uh, right now, uh, it seems after the pandemic, there's only one entity in the state of Minnesota that's sitting on a lump sum of cash and watching their savings continue to grow, and it's the state government itself. So we need to give Minnesota families and business owners um, the means to be able to do the exact same. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Then we'll move on to the next question. It goes to Heidi Gunderson first. In the next biennium, what do you believe should be Minnesota's spending priorities? I think education, um, I think public safety, 
And um, again, I, I think when we when we look at some of the programs that we have in health and human services, it's it's a very big line item on the budget. But how are we how are we spending that? We need to make sure that we're catching up with mental health services, and adequately funding health care as well as education and public safety. Thank you. The question now goes to Susie Strom. We should continue to invest in education and health care. Our state has a high quality of life because we invest in those things. Um, and, you know, 70% of our, our budget is, uh, is um, dedicated to that. And we should continue to invest in those things so that Minnesota is a place that businesses continue to come to and um, where families uh, enjoy growing up, growing up. Thank you. The question goes to Elliot Ingen. Yeah, when it comes to how we're going to be spending money, I think it should go towards the priorities that Minnesotans know, use, trust, and care about, uh, whether it's our infrastructure and growing our infrastructure so that our vibrant economy can uh, come back. Um, adequately funding education is definitely a priority of mine. And public safety. Uh, we're watching right now as we're in the third straight year of year-over-year year record crime increases. So I think that adequately funding our law enforcement agencies and first responders is definitely something that I would uh, I would support. Thank you. The question now goes to Brian Curran. Great. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, like many here, I agree that education is a priority for spending in Minnesota. Um, we've um, already discussed uh, quite a few uh, areas where that funding could go and to make sure that we're um, providing an environment where students can learn um, and succeed and be prepared for the future. Um, and I know also as a former law enforcement officer myself that public safety funding is crucial uh, in the state of Minnesota. While nationally we may have seen, uh, nationally and statewide, we may have seen some increases in crime um, in our district. Thankfully, uh, in White Bear Lake specifically, we've actually seen a decrease in crime. Um, so I think some of the principles that we're practicing on a local level needs to be brought to our to our state government. Um, and lastly, I would say that uh, health and human services is another area where we need to make sure we're providing, um, providing affordable services for folks and that it's accessible. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? And we'll move on to the next question. It goes to Elliot Engen first. What strategies would you recommend to address the impact of, inf of inflation on Minnesota citizens? Well, we all saw that Keynesian economics doesn't work at the federal level. Uh, printing money as if you're going to be running out of paper or ink is definitely not something that's sustainable. But here in the state of Minnesota, we can make sure that our budgets are responsible, that we value the taxpayer, and that we are spending money where it is going to be not only most well spent, but it's also going to be transparent in that there is no waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, if there are, such as the Feed Our Future scandal, uh, that costs taxpayers $400 million. So tackling inflation can actually be something that government does through its own uh, responsible uh, providing of services, and making sure that we're, we're utilizing those dollars the best, the best that we can. Thank you. The question now goes to Brian Curran. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to address that inflation is a global problem to begin with. Um, so it's not just a problem that we're seeing here in the Twin Cities or across the state of Minnesota or even in the United States. It's a global problem right now. There are many contributing factors um, to the inflation that we're feeling, and we're all feeling it. Um, there, are, again, were proposals on the table to address this um, that would have put money back in the pockets of Minnesotans. Um, and would have addressed issues um, like rising child care costs, uh, rising health care costs, um, increased education costs for higher education. Um, so I think there's, there's a multifaceted approach to uh, tackling inflation. It's not just one simple solution. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. Yeah, I think most, most folks saw the news today about the 8.3% increase uh, year over year. And it, albeit it was a slight decrease from last month, um, I think that that's artificially low due to the release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that uh, President Biden's been doing to keep the gas prices low. That won't continue, so I think we're going to see another bump. Um, we saw what the stock market did today, and we will see potentially another increase in interest rates next week. 
um, as the Federal Reserve responds to this issue. I, I feel like the single most thing that we can do in Minnesota is, again, stop overtaxing our citizens so they have more money in their pocket. It is a bigger problem than just in Minnesota. It is a nationwide and, in some uh, aspects, global issue. But I think how we can help the, the hardworking folks in Minnesota is by meaningful tax cuts. Thank you. The question now goes to Susie Strom. As a mom, I know that inflation has been been tough on families, on family budgets, has been a strain on family budgets. Things like diapers, <laughs> formula, school supplies are the the cost of everyday items and everyday living are high, and and it is it is hard. Um, it's it's a global national problem, um, and and we should do what we can to help Minnesotans out in um, in dealing with with inflation. Um, again, there were many good things in the budget deal that um, the Republicans walked away from, but I will advocate for the things that were in that deal because it will put money back in the pockets of Minnesotans and, um, and make life a bit easier. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yeah, I, I just would like to respond that this is the most regressive tax that we could put on to Minnesotans. Um, inflation year over year, it's actually increased our food index by 11.4 percent, which is the highest that we've seen since 1979. Fuel has gone up 68 percent, electricity 15 percent, and groceries 14 percent. The best and most responsible way that we can address inflation right now is by long-term immediate tax cuts to Minnesota businesses and families. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Brianne. Um, I just wanted to add that, of course, we have seen added costs, uh, increased costs, especially over the past few years. But it's important to remember that uh, we do have several corporations across the nation who have been increasing prices uh, on consumers, taking advantage of the situation that we've been in. Um, so things like fuel, um, those costs have been high and had they stayed high because corporations were getting richer. So um, it's not necessarily that the costs to corporations were higher. Uh, it's sometimes those were taken advantage of. Thank you. Anyone else? Then we'll move on to the next question. Now we're going to move on to a new topic, public safety. The first question goes to you, Susie Strom. Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer, safer communities? Everyone in in our communities deserve to feel secure and and safe. Um, and common sense gun safety legislation is something that is important to me. It's important to me as a mom, as a mom with uh, kids in school. I also serve in, in the military, so I have been trained, highly trained, on weapon systems. And those weapon systems, are their purpose is to kill people in, in combat. Um, I believe things like red flag laws, just common sense things, uh, keeping guns out of um, the hands of folks that would um, harm themselves or others is important. Um, thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer communities? Thank you. Um, I, I read that question a little bit differently. I think that this is a public safety issue, and we're hearing it in our communities, and we're seeing repeat violent offenders with illegal guns committing crimes in our community and walking through a revolving door with no accountability for the criminals, for the prosecutors, for the judges that are letting these folks out. I think we need stiffer penalties uh, for these repeat offenders, especially when it comes to gun violence. And uh, I think we need accountability um, across the board and increasing in our public safety budget will help do that so our officers have all the tools that they need to get the bad guys off the street and that we're having some transparency in what judges and prosecutors are doing. Um, many times these folks, we, they don't, their records aren't public and I think it's important that the general public know um, what is being prosecuted and what type of sentences are being handed down. Thank you. The question now goes to Brian Gern. Thank you. 
Um, so I think, again, gun violence is another very complex issue in our society. It's tied to a whole lot of different um, different services that we provide, different rights that we have. So I don't think there's going to be one simple solution that is going to end gun violence or significantly reduce gun violence for us. Um, I believe that, you know, we, I, I firmly believe in our Second Amendment right. Um, you know, as a former police officer, um, I, I've handled weapons, I own weapons, um, I have no issue um, with our right to bear arms. But what I would like to see us do is keep guns out of schools. There is absolutely no reason that gun violence should be the leading cause of death in children in the United States. And we need to make sure that um, we're investing early on and making, I don't necessarily mean monetarily, but policy investments where we start small now and work on common ground so that we can take illegal guns off the streets and it'll make it safer even uh, for officers that not every call is gonna be um, a, a call that involves a gun as well. Thank you. The question now goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, so it's gonna start with strengthen, strengthening our sentencing guidelines for re these repeat violent uh, criminals who are in illegal possession of firearms. Now, following the tragic death of Dante Wright, John Choi, the Ramsey County prosecutor, had said that he would no longer be conducting these low-level uh, traffic stops that would result in felony convictions. Um, he has also been a proponent of red flag laws. He's been a proponent of increasing uh, the penalties up until that point. And that's where 98% of all illegal firearms are found in the state of Minnesota, in those traffic stops. So it's going to start with ensuring that our prosecutors and judges understand that they are not acting as activists, but rather as um, a benefit to the public good of safety. Uh, they need to be doing their job just as the rest of Minnesota does. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Susie. I have served as a, a military prosecutor, and I have worked extensively with law enforcement, and I've called them my, my colleagues. I know what it takes um, to to talk about um, holding people accountable, but I, as um, candidate Curran said, it's a complex issue and we need to do things um, like crime prevention measures um, in addition to common sense um, gun safety measures in order to address this issue. Thank you, anyone else? Yes, Brianne. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to add um, that, you know, there's been a lot of focus on what happens once someone commits the crime. And I think uh, there's a huge opportunity here where we need to look at options to prevent crime in the first place. Um, and that, of course, uh, is another discussion in itself. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that we're talking about um, trying to stop things even before they get to the point of crime or violent crime. And I don't believe that um, anyone wants violent criminals to walk the streets. I no, I certainly don't. Um, I want to make sure that we're invested in keeping people safe. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I just say that we can prevent crime in the first place by preventing repeat violent offenders from continually re-victimizing Minnesotans. And if we were to ensure that they aren't able to do that, then we wouldn't be seeing the 21% increase in crime that we have saw in, in the year 2021, according to the BCA. So when that report came out, it was just demonstrative of the exact notion that we're bringing up. We need to strengthen our sentencing guidelines. That's the first and foremost priority. Thank you. Heidi, any comments? No. Nope. And we'll move on to the next question. It goes to Brian first. How will you work to lower crime in Minnesota and improve public safety for all communities? Thank you. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're really fortunate in our district that um, our law enforcement is fantastic. Um, I've worked at the department before. Um, I volunteered there before. Um, and we have a wonderful group of officers in our community. Um, and I want to see Minnesotans across the state have that level of service. Um, I think it's really important that we look at where it's working, take great notes, and come back to legislation and see where we can make sure that folks across the state are receiving uh, those same kind of services. Thank you. The question now goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, we're going to make sure that our, our law enforcement officers and police officers, that they're adequately equipped to handle this uh, increase in crime that we're all seeing. Now, right now, we have the Hennepin County attorney, or a candidate, prospective candidate for Hennepin County attorney that hasn't actually stated whether or not she supported the dismantling of the Minneapolis Police Department. I think it needs to start, first and foremost, with acknowledging the fact that slashing budgets to our local law enforcement agencies is a bad idea. And if we start there, then we can at least get to the notion that they need to be adequately funded. 
they need to be adequately equipped to tackle this increase in crime. And we're very blessed and honored to have their endorsement in this race, myself and candidate Gunderson. So we will support our law enforcement agencies to tackle this issue. Thank you. The question goes to Susie Strom. Thank you. Again, everyone in our community deserves to feel safe and secure. That is very important. Um, as I mentioned previously, I have served as a military prosecutor. I have served as a special victims counsel, um, which is an advocate uh, for sexual assault survivors. And I've worked extensively with law enforcement um, to, to make sure that the justice system works. Um, there needs to be accountability for crime. And as I mentioned before, there also needs to be work done to make sure that there is crime prevention um, because it, ha it, it prevents harm from happening in the first place. Um, and we also need to make sure that we are providing tools to law enforcement so they can do their jobs and that we are supporting mental health um, programming. Thank you. The question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. You know, when I'm at the doors, crime and public safety is the number one issue that comes up. Um, I have a, a track record of supporting law enforcement as the mayor of Adnes Heights, and that's why I've earned the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association endorsement. I think making sure that they're adequately funded to not only uh, recruit, but train and retain their forces um, is, is of the utmost importance. These men and women are out putting themselves in danger to protect us every day, and we want to make sure that they have the resources that they need. I, I do also think that mental health services are a piece of this puzzle, um, not in replacement of, of police officers, but certainly working as a supplement to the public safety issue. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Brianne. Thank you. Um, yeah, just with regard to additional resources for police, I just want to make it really clear that that's absolutely something that we need to invest in. And not only do we need to make sure that um, our officers, officers themselves are being uh, adequately, adequately compensated for the service they're providing, but we need to make sure that they have all the resources around them to support them, to keep them healthy. Uh, we can't expect people to serve us if they're not healthy themselves. Um, and so I think it's really important that we have um, those mental health services specifically uh, for our officers as well who deal with issues uh, from, from duty. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I would like to share a story really quick. When knocking doors in Lionel Lakes, I came across a gentleman who is a fam uh, he's a husband, uh, has two kids, Army veteran, and uh, spent 10 years on the Minneapolis Police Department. He said that he called it quits when he saw um, people, onlookers, um, shouting obscenities as he was performing CPR on a five-year-old drowned victim. It starts also with our culture. We need to come back to a culture where we respect police officers and uh, incentivize us all to see them as humans. You know, they wear a bulletproof vest to work, so we should be uh, adequately funding them and respecting them. Thank you. Anyone else? Then we're going to move on to the next question and the next topic, which is health care. The question goes to you first, Elliot. Do you support the current Minnesota constitutional right to an abortion? What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact concerning current laws and government policies related to abortion? Yeah, so here in the state of Minnesota, we have the Doe v. Gomez decision. And abortion is not on the ballot. It is not on the ballot. Um, it really comes down to this. There are things that we can do right now to increase the quality of life amongst Minnesotans. And it starts with the economy, it starts with crime. When it comes to abortion, uh, this is definitely a personally held belief for a lot of folks. And I'm a pro-life candidate, I'm not gonna lie to you. But anybody who says that this election is about abortion is doing this for clicks, cash, and outrage. It's a political answer. It's not one that has any merit because it's already been decided here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. The question now goes to Susie Strom. I am the only candidate running in 36A who believes that a woman should have the freedom to make their own reproductive health care choices without government interference. And the vast majority of Minnesotans agree. And when elected, I will protect reproductive rights. My daughters should not have fewer freedoms or rights than I did growing up. And, and we need to codify access to reproductive rights and access to abortion in, in the Minnesota Constitution. Thank you. 
question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Sure. As Candidate Engen said, uh, the right to an abortion is constitutionally protected by the Minnesota Constitution. Regardless of who's elected governor or who's elected to the legislature, they will have zero ability to take that right away. It takes many, many steps, uh, a ballot question or a fundamental change in the Minnesota Supreme Court to even discuss that. And I would agree, many Minnesotans, the majority of Minnesotans are, are uh, pro-choice candidates. I'm, I'm a pro-life candidate. Uh, I do believe there are exceptions in, in the case of the, the mother's life or in uh, rape or incest. But I do believe it's really, really personal. People feel very, very strongly, and for multiple reasons. I have, I have reasons for why I feel the way I feel, but the reality is, as Kenneth Engen said, it's not on the ballot. Thank you. Question now goes to Brianne Curran. Thank you. Um, I want to start by saying that in the United States, um, we also thought it was protected. We thought the right to have an abortion in the United States was protected. And we very recently learned that can be taken away in the blink of an eye. And that comes from decisions that were made by elected officials in the United States. So while it might not be on the ballot this year, what we need to be careful of is protecting the right in Minnesota and that means we need to take an investment in who's going to make those decisions and make sure that we're electing people who believe uh, in the right to choose, the right to have an access, the right to have access to abortion. And uh, it's simply dangerous if folks don't have that access. And we need to make a long-term plan that we're not going to allow uh, over time um, the Supreme Court in Minnesota to be infiltrated by people who might try to overturn it here as well. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Just one thing. What Candidate Coran just said, actually, um, it, it proved us right that this is not on the ballot, that this long-term investment really is long-term. This, this, nothing could happen in the next two years. Nothing could happen with a Republican governor, uh, Republican Senate, and a Republican House. So if it's a long-term strategy, um, then it's really not something that I think is most pressing for Minnesotans at the, at the current time. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Brianne. Yeah, um, I acknowledge that. At the same time, uh, we all know that we make progress uh, slowly over time. And uh, investments, again, they're in called investments for a reason, where we start from the beginning that we hope to reach uh, an end goal at some time. So I, I do think it's fair to say that even though uh, somebody might serve two years, um, there is work that people can do in two years that makes a difference. And uh, there are people who can um, advocate for those rights and continue to advocate for those rights uh, beyond the two-year term. Thank you. Susie? Yes. Additionally, I, that is misleading. There is proposed legislation every session that is anti-choice and would take away the freedom of Minnesotans to make their own reproductive health care choices. Thank you. Any additional comment? Okay. We're going to move on to the next question. It goes to Susie first. What is your position on ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to affordable health care? Health care is like such an important issue uh, for Minnesotans. And I think there are um, things that we can do, such as lowering prescription costs, um, having uh, Minnesota care buy-in options, um, and just making health care accessible and affordable to all Minnesotans, working families, and seniors. Thank you. Question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. I think health care costs are, are a very big issue. They continue to rise. We're seeing Medicare costs go up. Prescription drug prices are crazy. We all know this, and we all experience it. I think access is a big issue. And we're seeing nurses and doctors that are leaving their professions are talking about retiring early, which is going to continue to limit our access. I think transparency and costs and a, a more open and diverse marketplace could help with that so people would have, um, they have the information in front of them to make a choice about where they want to get their services. I think when someone calls their local or their, their family doctor and asks to make an appointment and they're sitting six weeks out, they end up going to an urgency room or urgent care for, uh, for things that maybe aren't best placed there. Um, I, I do think training up nurses and, and offering incentives for advanced practice RNs and nurse practitioners could help some of that. Um, but I, I think really access and transparency are the most important things. Thank you. 
question now goes to uh, Brian. Thank you. Um, yeah, I absolutely think um, you know healthcare is, is has always been a very important issue in Minnesota, and uh, we're seeing that now uh, with the nurses' strike that's happening. Um, I'm proud to be endorsed by the Minnesota Nurses Association. I was out there picketing with them yesterday, um, and just listening to the needs that they have, um, and that ultimately affects uh, the the consumer or the patient. Um, so we need to make sure that we are putting people over profits. We need to make sure um, that we're uh, holding corporations, again, accountable and hospital leadership accountable. Uh, CEOs in the medical field are making more than they ever have. And while uh, transparency is great, we need to make sure that we're lowering costs for folks. Um, it's just getting too expensive. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're holding people accountable for that. Thank you. Question now goes to Elliot Angan. Yeah, it's no secret that health care is simply too expensive for the modern American family. Um, the one thing that we can do immediately is price transparency and easing access to telehealth. I think telehealth medicine is one of the silver linings that came out of the pandemic, and if we can continue to increase those services, uh, it could be of great benefit to the Minnesota families who are struggling right now. Another thing that I've looked at is called the direct, direct primary care model, and it's been instituted in states such as Texas, as well as Washington, a red state and a blue state, and they both saw awesome benefits out of it. Essentially what we need to do is allow patients to have easier access to their direct primary care physician so that we can catch those long-term ailments before they become uh, much more serious, much more critical, as well as much more expensive. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Susie. Again, I think transparency is fine um, around drug prices and it's important, um, but we can and we should do more to just to work to actually reduce costs of, um, of prescriptions. Um, I think there's a good example of bipartisan work that was done last session. There was an, the Insulin Affordability Act um, addressing the opioid problem. So we need to work in a bipartisan way to reduce costs for Minnesotans. Thank you, anyone else? Yeah, I would just say this. Um, as, as someone who has seen how insulin affordability really can impact a family, you know, my, my uh, middle brother, Noah, he has type, type 1 diabetes. And right now he's also struggling with supply chain issues of getting that insulin to, uh, to the doorstep. So we need to not only think about what we're going to be doing for price, what we're, going be, what we're going to be doing for transparency, but also ease of access and making sure that those critical tools are in the hands of Minnesotans that need them the most. Thank you. Anyone else? Then we'll move on to the next question, and it goes to Brian first. Should the state invest in more mental health resources, and if so, how should that be done? Thank you. Um, yes, we absolutely should be investing in more mental health resources. Um, and like I've mentioned, this is another topic where we need to make sure that we're uh, very diligent um, when we're in the legislative session, that we're paying attention to different areas, different issue areas. Um, mental health isn't just something that we deal with in the health system. It's something that we deal with in the education system. We deal with it in the public safety system. And so we need to make sure that when we are talking about mental health, that we're very mindful about the different uh, aspects of, of the lives of Minnesotans um, that mental health affects. And um, so we're going we're gonna to need to make sure it's addressed in public safety. And again, not just for community members, but for officers as well. And we need to make sure that um, students have the mental health resources that they need in the classroom or in the, in the school um, so that they can, that can help facilitate a better learning environment for them. Thank you. The question goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, I think first and foremost, we need to be investing in our students in classrooms that just saw as uh, they were taken out of classrooms for two and a half years. Uh, that had a direct impact on their mental health. And if we're able to address that first and foremost, then I think that we can start to uh, talk about other, other areas as well. Um, with the sh stark increases that we've seen in not only suicidality, but in, in calls for help, um, that's something that teachers also need to be adequately equipped with. So we need to make sure that the funding and the resources and availability for help is there. Thank you. The question goes to Susie Strom. Yes, we should support mental um, health services um, in the schools for our students that just went through a global pandemic, for our teachers, for our law enforcement. Um, something that is personally important to me is mental health services to veterans. Um, 
as a veteran, I, I think we need to provide essential and needed services to those who have served us. So mental health programs are, are a very important piece to the puzzle. Thank you. Question goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you, and let me take this opportunity to thank you for your service. Uh, I, I think that the mental health issue has become so prevalent in almost every aspect of our lives. It's the root issue of so many things that uh, issues that Minnesotans are concerned about when I talk to them at the doors. So adequate, adequately funding so many of the programs that we need access is also a difficult thing with mental health. I hear stories from folks um, out at the doors that it's taking months to get themselves or their children in to get services. So we need to figure out how we're going to get the professionals out there to do the work and then we're going to make, need to make sure that we're adequately funding it uh, at the state level, especially in the schools. And I, as I mentioned previously, I think uh, mental health services working in concert with with our police and peace officers is something that needs to be supplemented as well. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Then we'll move on to the next question and the next topic, which is elections. The question goes to you first, Heidi. As a member of the legislator, legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence that our elections are secure and the results are accurate? Sure, this issue um, doesn't come up very often, but I, I, I think that there's ways that we can work as, as a legislature to make sure that our elections are secure. Do I think that there's voter fraud? Probably. Um, I don't know that it's a rampant issue, but we should want every vote to count, and we should want everyone to have access to the ability to vote. So I think any, any safeguards that we can put in to make sure that our elections are safe and secure would be something that we should focus in on. Um, I think that you know identification could be, could be a piece of the puzzle, but I think it's something that needs a hard look. Thank you. Question goes to Elliot Engen. Yeah, we want to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And the way that we can do that here in the state of Minnesota is through voter ID. And if that's brought up, and there are uh, some that say that uh, some folks don't have adequate access to the services needed to get an ID, then maybe we should start with that because we need one to get a job. We need one to go on a plane, rent a car. Um, th this is something that we should be first and foremost tackling the issue of IDs. And then after that, we can install voter ID legislation to make sure that nobody can claim, uh, can claim that an election has been stolen or that an election is, is rigged. If we have those safeguards in place, it actually increases everybody's confidence that the election was done in good faith. Thank you. Question goes to Brian. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think Minnesotans are pretty confident in how our election system works already, uh, considering the high voting turnout that we've had year after year, which I think is amazing. Uh, it makes me proud to live in this state where we all participate in democracy the way that we do. Um, I don't believe that putting up barriers to voting is an answer, um, and I, I do think that there is a lot of integrity currently in Minnesota elections, um, and I know that there's been conversations across the nation, but speaking specifically to Minnesota, um, you know, cases of voter fraud are small, and where we find them, we do need to make sure we close those gaps. Thank you. Question goes to Susie Strom. I, I'm so proud to be a Minnesotan because of our secure and our fair elections. I'm proud because we um, participate at, um, in democracy and voting at the highest, um, one of the highest uh, rates. Um, we just need to continue the work that we do, and we need to continue to ensure that elections stay fair and, and secure. Thank you. Any additional comments? Then we're going to go into a rapid fire. I'm going to call on one after another. These are yes or no answers, only yes or no. And I will start with Elliot. Do you support or not support the use of Absentee ballots? Yes. Susie? Yes. Brianne? Yes. Heidi? Yes. Next question. We'll start with you again, Elliot. Do you support or oppose a drop box voting? Oppose. Susie? Support. Support. Oppose. Same day registration? Support. 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 Mail in ballots? Support. 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 Automatic voter registration at driver's license centers. Support. 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 Voter ID. Support. Oppose. Oppose. Support. Thank you. 
We'll move on to the next question and it will go to Elliot first. And looking at our clock, this will be the last question. If elected, what will your top three priorities be and why? My first and foremost priority is going to be making sure that the economy is affordable again. Uh, Minnesota families are struggling with inflation. Uh, 9.2 percent uh, a couple months ago and as uh, candidate Gunderson reiterated it was 8.3 today uh, that is the highest that it's been since 1979 and we have to make sure that we're providing uh, affordable goods and services for everyday folks number two being tackling the crime increases that we're all experiencing if we can get this under control then we can finally have Minnesota be a safe and and affordable place to live work and raise a family that's what it's all about it's very basic it's very simple but that's where, we're, where we need to start and number three is making Minnesota a hub rather than some place that folks want to leave we saw an exodus in uh, the past couple of years and we were 27 folks away from losing a congressional seat we want to make sure that Minnesotans stay and we want to incentivize every single stage of life to be able to live, work, and raise a family here in the state of Minnesota rather than go elsewhere where there might not be a tax on Social Security. So that'd be my first and foremost priority. Thank you. Next question now goes to Brian. Thank you. Uh, my top three priorities, if elected, are simple for me. Uh, one is human services. I've worked in the human services field for 20 years uh, within our district currently. Um, and we have uh, we have really lost um, lost touch with what the disability community needs. Oftentimes, when we're at the negotiating table in session, uh, it's one of the first things to come off the table. And unfortunately, folks with disabilities aren't really able to um, don't necessarily have the access to get to the Capitol to stand up for themselves. And so, we need to make sure we have elected officials like myself who aren't afraid to advocate for folks who aren't able to do so for themselves. Um, I also want to make sure that we are taking taking um, the necessary necessary uh, time to uh, focus on education and meeting the needs of teachers and students. Um, we've discussed a lot of different ways to do that tonight, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure they have the resources to succeed. And finally, um, you know, as a former police officer, public safety is still a huge passion of mine. Since I left law enforcement, running for office uh, is my way to give back to the public, so I need want to make sure that we're keeping public safety well-funded. Thank you. Question now goes to Susie Strom. Yes, so for me, education is one of my top priorities as a mom with girls that are going through the public school system. That is very important that we keep our schools strong um, to, to make sure that our communities thrive. Secondly, um, healthcare, human services are very important healthcare for women, healthcare for seniors and working families. And, and making sure that we are taking care of all Minnesotans. And thirdly, uh, the environment is very important, um, especially in, in our community where we do have wonderful natural resources. And, and, and um, we want to make sure that we are combating climate change, that we are making sure that we are not um, ex being exposed to toxic um, chemicals, and so those three things are my top three priorities. Thank you. Question now goes to Heidi Gunderson. Thank you. I, I think number one on my list of priorities is the economy. I think we need, with a historic surplus, we need to work hard to, with meaningful tax cuts to put that money back in the pockets of Minnesotans so they can, at their kitchen tables, have enough money to not worry about whether or not they can afford food, rent, or energy. I think second for me is public safety. We need to be holding criminals accountable, make sure that law enforcement has the money to recruit re and retain their officers and especially train them, um, and they have all the resources they need and holding prosecutors and judges accountable for sentencing. And I think lastly for me is, well not lastly, but my third is uh, education. Um, we need to make sure that the teachers and the students have the resources they need coming off of the pandemic to try to decrease this achievement gap, get them back on track, and make sure they're prepared for the future. Thank you. We will now go to closing statements, and we will start with our candidates in for 36A, and we'll start with Elliot Engen. My name is Elliot Engen, and I'm running in District 36A because I believe that our community is one worth fighting for. I never intended to run for office, but I found myself here because I saw a void in leadership. I saw a lot of folks that were willing and able to point fingers and try to cast stones as to where the issue first came from, rather than roll up their sleeves and try to find solutions to those issues in the first place. I think that as a product of our community, as somebody who uh, had my first job on Main Street, my first date in our local movie theater, and uh, now I'm blessed to call this my home, 
uh, there's a lot that we can do to bring optimism to our future here in the state of Minnesota in our, in our community. And first and foremost, it's gonna be through a vibrant economy, second, through safe streets, and third, through an education that everybody can call excellent. So thank you so much, and with any questions, please feel free to reach out via my website at www.elliotangen.com. Thank you. Next with her closing statement, Susie Strom. Thank you. I'm Susie Strom, and I'm running to be your next state representative in 36A. And I, I want to continue to serve our community and country. Um, I'm a mom, a U.S. Army veteran, and current reservist. I'm an attorney, a Korean American adoptee. I want to bring the, the breadth and depth of my experience in the military, the private sector, um, to the legislature. Throughout my life, I, I have worked with people from all over the world and from all over our country to accomplish the mission. Um, people didn't always look like me, people didn't always have the same perspective, but we worked together to make things happen and get the job done. Our community members deserve a representative who will work hard to make life better for them, who will communicate openly and honestly, who won't rely on sound bites and dismiss um, community members' concerns. And I'm here to work and get the job done. I hope for your vote in November. Thank you. Next with her closing statement is Brian Curran, House District 36B. Thank you. Um, I want to say uh, first and foremost thank you to Lee Women's Voters uh, for holding this forum for us tonight. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to be one of two candidates here who know the feeling of taking an oath um, to put your life on the line to protect others and to serve. Um, you can expect that same level of commitment from us at the state capitol, I can guarantee that. Um, it's time for Minnesotans to be represented by people who've walked the walk, who've made sacrifices uh, that we're often too humble to talk about, who can find common ground and who will truly truly appreciate uh, the incredible gift it is uh, to have this opportunity to serve our communities, our state, and our country. Um, this election is about our rights and freedoms. It's about how we look out for our neighbors regardless of politics. It's about truth and it's about respect. And we need to fully fund police, public safety resources, protect our right to bear arms while keeping guns out of schools, protect freedom of reproductive choice, provide honest public education and and end discrimination and provide affordable housing health care and transportation thank you thank you next with her closing statement is heidi gunderson thank you and thank you to the league of women voters for this forum and also congratulations to my fellow candidates it takes a lot of courage to put your name on the ballot so i applaud you for that and i think uh, the reality is we probably are all here for similar reasons but i'm heidi gunderson and i'm running in 36b I'm a mom, I'm a small business owner, and a wife, and I currently serve my community as the mayor of Adnes Heights. One thing that I've learned in my service as the mayor and as a council member is that you have to make compromise. And I think that our community wants a leader that can go to St. Paul, reach across the aisle, and have good conversations, learn where the other side is coming from, negotiate, and make compromises to move things forward for the folks in Minnesota. Thank you. The League thanks the candidates for their participation, Nine North for taping and broadcasting this event, our League volunteers and you, the audience, for your attendance and interest. Let your voice be heard. Vote by November 8th. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.